Hello, this is topic two, so by distribution, key adverse effects, mechanistic events caused by realistic nanomaterial exposure. My name is Fleming Cassé, and I present this together with Min Beom Hio, Landma Hock, Rules Hintz, Ilse Gosens, Sibyl van der Brulle, and Trine Berting. So this work package two was on in vivo anchoring of in vitro assays by identification of both adverse outcome pathways with key events to develop advanced cell assays that were based on toxicity data from in vivo studies, as well as identification and interaction of nanomaterials at the tissue and cell uh, level, uh, which also is used for by distribution information. So the work package consisted of five different tasks. Uh, we start with collecting all kinds of information from uh, the literature or other databases, as mentioned, uh, particularly focusing on chronic, but also later on subchronic inhalation and oral toxicity studies. Uh, that work has been finished uh, in quite in early in the project and was submitted in month 12. That was uh, then extended by evaluating information of these studies and trying to collect also tissues and additional information for both oral and inhalation studies and some new studies were initiated uh, that will be explained in the, the later slides here. Uh, and in addition, um, as mentioned in uh, the previous slide, there was quite a lot of emphasis on identifying the bio kinetics of the materials as that would guide also the modeling uh, from in vivo to in vitro and also targeting which cells should be studied in in vitro uh, assays. And the last one is the identification of mechanistic key events linked to adverse outcome pathways and Sibyl van Brulle will uh, show a few slides on that topic. In task 2.1, um, the Petros partners collected existing data. Um, this may be um, published data in the literature or unpublished data. And uh, we give strong preference for studies according to OECD guidelines and uh, give preference also to the subchronic chronic exposure duration because this duration are more relevant for risk assessment. Um, the task leader is an RCWE, and the other partner, LITAP, um, IVM, CRIS, IUF, and BSF contribute to this task. Um, the output is a um, type of um, table database, include the FISCAM properties of the respective test material study design, and for example, which red strain, um, how long was the exposure per day and uh, we, how many days and how long was the recovery period, which endpoint is determined. And then we summarize the relevant adverse outcomes, including the endpoint, general toxicity, any um, inflammation findings, fibrosis, um, non neoplastic, neoplastic changes, and um, if any, um, also the determined no adverse effect concentration or low L in this study. And uh, we give uh, also emphasis on the dosimetry and biodistribution, the dosimetry for inhalation study, for example, is slum burden. And the biodistribution is um, the uh, test material in the extra pulmonary organs tissues of different um, recovery period. And um, the report and the database can be found on the public deliverable side of the Petro's website. And um, this uh, slide showed the test materials we collected um, in this slide, we include also some five-day studies, but in, but in our based uh, database, we give a highly preference to the 90 days and two years studies. And the first column are different materials, and then we 
specified um, the type of the materials in the second column and um, give also some information on the type of the study and duration and data honor and the references. And uh, all the details, as I said, can be found in the uh, Petro's website. The contribution of the IOF in Dusseldorf to Work Package 2 was the investigation of the effects of oral exposures to engineered nanomaterials. To some extent, we performed exposure studies, but most of the data for this task were actually generated from tissue samples that were already available from previous studies. In all cases, the design of the study involved the addition of nanomaterials to feed pellets. This represents a physiological way of exposure in contrast to gavage applications of nanomaterials, which you see mostly in the literature. The main goal of our investigations was to relate all observed in vivo findings to data obtained with in vitro models that were generated and further developed in work package four of patrols. Our work has resulted in several publications shown here. In the first study published in small, we evaluated markers of inflammation and genotoxicity in mice exposed to titanium dioxide or silver nanoparticles. Combined with in vitro testing of the same materials, it allowed us to determine the feasibility of several models of increasing complexity for the hazard testing of nanomaterials in the gut. In a subsequent study described in our paper published in Nanotoxicology, the effects of oral exposure to four of the most used and investigated types of nanomaterials were compared on the microbiome level. And in these studies, we found subtle but potentially health relevant changes in composition of microbiota following oral exposure to silver nanoparticles, as well as to silica nanoparticles. Most recently, and again, that was done by means of combined analysis of in vivo effects in mice and in vitro testing of the same nanomaterials, we identified similarities in expression changes of specific mucin genes. And this indicates their potential as biomarkers of adverse effects in the gut of nanomaterials. Apart from the specific study findings from our laboratory, we also shared various tissues from our oral exposure studies with several project partners of patrols. As such, for instance, liver tissue samples from our mouse studies could be used at Harriet Watt University to support the identification of Connexin 32 as a potential biomarker of nanomaterially induced liver damage. Other tissue samples from the intestine, for instance, were made available for dark field analysis of tissues in the context of toxicokinetic investigations as part of work package two. And finally, the set of established microbiome data from our oral exposure studies were also used for cross species comparison studies between mice and the zebrafish model used in work package five. At Chris, we are participating in task 2.3, evaluation and complementation of repeated dose oral toxicity studies. We conducted research on a subclonic oral uh, toxicity test with three nanomaterials in nets, according to OECD TG408. The test items are titanium dioxide P25, food grade titanium dioxide E171, and sodium dioxide NM212. The objective of these three studies was to investigate the potential toxicity profile of test materials after 13 weeks of oral garbage administration at those uh, 0 to 1,000 mg per kilogram once a day in SD rats, and to assess the reversibility of any effects during four weeks of recovery period. 
the Noel of three testament trials was considered uh, to be 1,000 milligram per kilogram, and we didn't see any uh, systemic adverse effects. As follows, uh, these uh, findings have already been uh, published for the paper. We are also participating in task 2.4, defined uh, engineered nanomaterials, biokinetics, and key tissues for biodistribution and target organs. First, we conducted a toxicokinetics study on tissues from post-grade titanium dioxide E171, 90-day oral toxicity study using ICP-OES. As a result, titanium was not detected in liver, kidneys, uh, spleen, and ileum, all of those studied organs. The, sa the same samples are being analyzed using icp top for reproducibility and accuracy of these uh, results. In addition, we are investigating some organ burden on sodium dioxide treated sample. In task 2.4, the RFEM has performed biodistribution studies after inhalation. The analysis of already existing studies described in Deliverable 2.1 revealed that although for some nanomaterials there is data on biodistribution, it was not enough to improve a physical-based kinetic model. Therefore, we aim to generate complete data sets for serum dioxide, NM212, and titanium dioxide, NM105. We wanted to answer different questions and that has driven our study design. We wanted to know, for example, how is the nanomaterial divided over the different lung compartments after deposition? And therefore, we not only determined the total amount of nanomaterial in the lung, but um, have separated lavaged lung tissue and the lavage fluid. The lavage fluid is representative for the free fraction that is available on the alveolar epithelium. And we also determined the fraction that is taken up by phagocytosis cells. We also wanted to know if there are accumulation extrapulmonary organs, such as liver, spleen, and kidney. We were also wondering what are the organ burdens at different dose ranges, and does it differ after applying a low dose compared to a mid or a high dose? And how does a single exposure scale to repeated consecutive uh, exposure? And what is the level and rate of excretion? And therefore, we also determined the serum and titanium amount in urine and feces by ICPMS. For these biodistribution studies, we have exposed male whistler rats, nose only, to aerosols of titanium dioxide and serum dioxide nanomaterials. You can see the aerosol exposure setup on the right. The materials had a similar nominal particle size from dry powder and also a comparable aerodynamic diameter when dispersed in air. We exposed the rats for six hours, it's called a single exposure, or a repeated exposure of two times five days to three different dose levels, a low, mid and a high dose, by varying the time um, of exposure. Below you see an example of uh, repeated exposure to serum dioxide, and the serum content is measured in the liver. The content was determined one day uh, post-exposure, 30 days or 60 days, and you can see a time-dependent increase and a dose-dependent increase in serum content in the liver. In contrast to the right figure, which shows a repeated exposure to titanium dioxide and the content of titanium in the liver, which is only increased one day post-exposure, but does not accumulate in the liver. In summary, 
The similar study design and exposure setup allowed for comparable deposited lung doses and for comparing the entire distribution of poorly soluble nanomaterials, serum dioxide and titanium dioxide. The dose range was varied by increasing exposure time per day, 30 minutes, 2 hours or 6 hours, and this resulted in a linear increase in lung deposition. We found that titanium dioxide was cleared faster from the lung with T and a half of 20 days, independent of the applied dose range, compared to serum dioxide, which the half-life varied from 40 to 130 days. We saw accumulation in the liver increasing during the one to two month post-exposure period after repeated exposure to serum dioxide, while we did not observe this after titanium dioxide exposure. Serum was detected in excretions, human and feces, 18 hours after exposure, while titanium uh, levels were only increased in feces above control directly after the single exposure. The curated datasets have been transferred to the controls database and were used in the PBK modeling in Work Package 6. I am Trine Batting from the National Research Center for the Working Environment in Denmark. In patrols, we performed an oral rat study to compare the biodistribution of cerium oxide nanomaterial after daily oral exposure by gavage or in a snack. The snack, which you see in the picture, was cerium oxide mixed into chocolate spread and served on a piece of biscuit. The rats were exposed to two doses for two weeks and with two weeks recovery. The study was designed with support from the patrols partners with the main aim to quantify the organ burden in liver and spleen over time. And this was to provide data for uh, computer models of biodistribution being developed in patrols. We also looked at particle localization in liver and intestine, which was relevant for the in vitro models in patrols. And also we wanted to compare the quantitative uptake from snack as a food matrix and gavage, which is relevant for future nanotox studies. The organ burden was analyzed by ICPMS at the Technical University of Denmark. And here in the graphs, you see the serum concentration in nanogram per gram of uh, liver and gram of spleen. And the orange curve is the high-dose gavage, and the blue curve is the high-dose snack. And we found a statistically significantly increased concentration of cerium in liver after one and two weeks of exposure. And during the two-week recovery, the concentration decreased, except for uh, two of four rats in the high-dose gavage group. There was no statistically significant difference in the liver burden between the snack and the gavage dosing. In spleen, the concentration was at least twofold lower than in liver, except after recovery where the serum increased for the gavage groups. And in conclusion, the daily exposure to serum oxide by gavage and by snack resulted in comparable and dose and time dependent uptake in liver of about 0.2 parts per million of the total administered dose. And the daily snack provided an effective and controlled administration of dose and appeared less stressful to rats. Besides the biodistribution, we found indications of necrotic changes in liver and reduced density of cells in the white pub of spleen after both gavage and snack and we also found possible particles in the small intestine, but this still needs to be verified. In patrols, we also did enhanced dark field imaging of nanomaterials in vivo and in vitro. And the purpose was to identify organs and cell types that interact directly with nanomaterials and therefore would be relevant for in vitro nanosafety testing. We analyzed tissues from new and old studies from partners in the project. And here on the slide, there are white, you can see white particles in mouse or rat, a lung, intestine and liver, and also in a human liver spheroid. 
The results can be found in the public reports on the patrol's webpage or in the two publications here on the slide. So this part of the project is, um, is to optimize in vitro testing for predictivity with the aim of uh, identifying key events for health effect of nanomaterials via lung and oral exposure to nanomaterial. The strategy used for this uh, task was based on the identification of and development of adverse outcome pathways which are linear sequences of key events, molecular initiating events and key events that you see uh, on your screen, linking a toxicant and uh, an organ response or an adverse outcome. So the first step was to identify a nano-relevant uh, adverse outcomes and so we selected four patrols, adverse outcome lung to, uh, linked to uh, lung, lung exposure, uh, which is uh, lung inflammation, lung fibrosis, cancer and mesothelioma, and adverse outcomes linked to uh, oral exposure, liver inflammation, fibrosis and liver cancer. Uh, the second step was to identify AOPs and key events that could be used in these, uh, to develop uh, these uh, adverse outcome pathways. And you have here where the work that we have done. So you have uh, in blue the nano-relevant AOPs network for uh, lung adverse outcomes and uh, in pink uh, for liver adverse outcomes. Uh, with this work, we identified potential biomarkers with uh, their cellular models and assays. And the aim was to inform and to guide uh, in vitro partners from patrols and vice versa to um, identify gaps and key events which are covered in patrols. So you have here in green the key events which are tested by uh, in vitro partners. And so what we can uh, deduce from that is that at least one key event is covered by adverse outcome, and that more than half of the key events are also covered. So which means that the strategy that we used uh, using these uh, AOPs and key events uh, was appropriate to uh, identify pre um, predictive biomarkers. Thank you for your attention. As regards to the impact of the activities in Work Package 2, uh, we initially identified data caps uh, from in vivo studies, both on adverse effect as well as on biodistribution for the nanomaterials that were selected within uh, patrols. And this uh, data cap was used uh, to uh, follow up our activities. So that means that we identified uh, existing tissues and uh, these were uh, analyzed mainly for localization of nanomaterials. And they came from both in vivo and oral, uh, in inhalation and oral studies. And then two new inhalation studies and one new oral studies have been uh, conducted, uh, mainly focusing on the biodistribution, but also uh, revealing information on adverse effects and toxicity. So the localization was uh, mainly seen in uh, lung, spleen and liver, and that data has also been uh, shared with others. As we got with the in vivo anchoring for in vitro work, um, eight existing adverse outcome pathways on pulmonary inflammation, emphysema, fibrosis, mesothelioma, uh, cancer and liver inflammation were identified to be relevant for nanomaterials. And also uh, certain key events were identified that can be uh, used in uh, in vitro assays developed in work package three and work package four. And that information has been transferred. And then lastly, the selected adverse outcome pathway 
that were identified were on inflammation processes and genotoxicity uh, should be used as priority uh, to be addressed um, in uh, future studies. As regards to the output of Work Package 2, uh, we have three curated patrols database files on the biodistribution studies transferred also to Work Package 6. Uh, we developed fact sheets, one on the lessons learned for the distribution of engineered nanomaterials in the body, uh, was focused on regulators. The other one, information regarding nanomaterials relevant adverse outcome pathways that was more targeted on the scientific researchers. Um, at the moment, you have uh, six scientific papers published um, or in preparation, uh, more to become, uh, but I think it's the fact that we didn't do uh, a lot of uh, research here, but was mainly based on collecting existing information. Uh, we already have a, a nice output, uh, but as I mentioned, uh, more uh, to become. So that's it, and as this is the last General Assembly meeting, I would like to thank all the collaborators within this work package, in particular also Ilse for managing the work package, also often uh, on my behalf, uh, but also all the other uh, partners within this project. I think we've achieved a lot of uh, work, um, good progress. Um, we did some interesting new studies that uh, some of which still have to be published in the open literature, of course. I also would like to thank uh, the rest of the patrols team um, because they also were waiting for our data, have used the data. I mentioned work package uh, three, four, and definitely also six. And uh, last but not all, also, of course, uh, Hildegard, Shireen, and Kevin for making everything happen. Uh, from a managerial point of view. Thank you very much and uh, happy to answer any question.